this is your Explaining Science panel, and today we will tackle the tough questions about popularizing uh, and discussing science uh, to a general audience. Should I press start here? There we go. We have exactly 50 minutes. What's going to happen is we're going to talk up here uh, amongst ourselves for a good 30, 40 minutes or something like that, and then we're going to open up to questions. I will repeat this when it becomes question time, but I will tell you now, this is how questions will go. We will have a person running around with a microphone, raise your hand, she will find you and come talk to you. Uh, when we do questions, there are three things you have to know. The first is the question should be in the form of a question. Uh, this is very important. Uh, your, the question should be a one-part question only. Uh, and uh, all the questions, as much as possible, should be as long as a tweet. That's 280 characters now, not 140 <laughs> characters. So you have twice as much to work with. The reason we do this is Perfect. not just because we have iron discipline and only 50 minutes to get through, but we want to make sure that we can answer uh, and get asked as many questions as possible from as many people as possible. I will repeat this later, but if you are thinking about questions, that's how you should be formulating them in your brain right now. We have some amazing folks up here to be talking to you about science and the popularization and discussion of science to the general uh, populace, and uh, they cover both discrete and overlapping uh, experiences in talking about science. And the first thing that I'm going to let them do is introduce themselves very briefly and explain their role in the, uh, in the propagation of science. And Annalie, let's start with you. Hey, I'm Annalie Newitz. I'm a science journalist, and I also write science fiction. Yes, science yeah. journalism. Yeah. Um, you might know me as the founder of io9, where we once, a long time ago, combined science and science fiction in our coverage. Um, and today, I'm an author of books. I write science fiction books. I write science books. Um, and that is my role, is to make people read things that get them excited about science. Uh, my name is Katie Mack. Um, I'm an astrophysicist, and, <laughs> and I study the universe, and one of the other things I like to do is to talk about that to people who are not scientists. Uh, so I do a lot of social media stuff, uh, talking about space and physics and things like that, and I give talks sometimes, and I'm working on a book about the end of the universe, it's called The End of Everything, uh, and it'll be out next year. My name is Mary Robinette Kowal. I am a puppeteer and an audiobook narrator, but I'm up here because I am a science fiction writer, and I, my job is to... Yeah! Uh, my, my job, um, I feel, is to help with science... I mean, part of my job is to help with science illiteracy, because most people learn their science through stories. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh. I, love, I love stories. I think that's awesome. So <laughs> we all tell stories up here. Yeah. We're among right. friends. Yes, exactly. No judgment. Uh, and then I'm John Scalzi. I'm your moderator. Uh, I write science fiction, but I have also written uh, books on science, including an astronomy book called Rough Guide to the Universe. Uh, and if you, in the early part of the tw uh, 21st century, read an Uncle John's bathroom reader that had a piece on uh, science in it. That was me. That was you? That was totally wow. me. My Canadian uncle's bathroom will now feel different to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was more information than I needed to know, so yeah. thank you. I'm sorry, uh, sharing you it's early in the morning from <laughs> Were all the contributors to that named John? I uh, know. It's just it sort of happened and they you know, one of the things that people ask me is like, Are you the Uncle John? <laughs> And I'm like, no, I'm merely a Uncle John. So uh, the first question that I kind of have, and this is kind of a general dis uh, question regarding uh, being able to talk to science to a, a very general audience, is I kind of personally, in my own, uh, having uh, written about science, kind of have a theory that 80%, just a, as a basic idea, of most science or scientific concepts are kind of easily explainable to the average person, and it's the extra 20% um, that requires more sort of in-depth discussion. Um, does this conform to your own uh, experience, you know, popularizing or explaining 
science. And then a, kind of a, a little bit of a follow-up there um, is that 80% uh, generally enough uh, when you are talking with science for people to get excited, enthused, and interested in science? Mary, you know, I was going to let one of the actual scientists go. Um, so I, I don't know about the, do, do we only need to understand about 80% because when I am writing stuff, I'm frequently understanding about 20% of what I'm actually writing about and go to an expert and then get them to explain it to me. Like, this is my writing process uh, with the Lady Astronaut books. I figure out sort of what I, I need the emotional arc to be and, and that there are plot points. And then I'll have big chunks that are written like this. And then the captain said jargon, as he jargoned the jargon. And then I hand it to someone who's an actual expert and say, well, you play Mad Libs <laughs> and fill that in for me. So I, I'm like, I, I basically treat science like a magic system. <laughs> I'm not kidding, no. actually. I treat magic science like a magic system. Uh, and with that in mind, I only need the reader to understand as much of it uh, as is necessary to understand the plot. The, the example that I usually give is when I talk about gravity. Like, for the most part, what people need to know about gravity in a book is that if I throw something at you, it's going to fall down. Um, you know, it's, it's going to move and then it's going to hit the ground eventually. And that's, you don't need to understand, like, gravity. You don't need to understand that. You, you have a, you have a, like, 10% maybe understanding of gravity. There's this thing that happens. But if my plot depends on orbital mechanics, and you need to understand that if you want a spaceship to catch up with another spaceship, that the spaceship actually in orbit actually has to slow down so that it drops to a lower gravity, which then causes it to go faster relative to the other spaceship, and then it can translate up and then catch the other spaceship, but if it actually speeds up, then it, it anyway. So, so that you actually, in order to, to do that, because you have to understand why they are slowing down. There you do need to understand more of, more of gravity. Um, so, so that's why I, I treat it like a magic system. I, I only explain as much as I need my readers to understand, and I understand a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, if it, so I think it depends a lot on what your goal is, how much you want, how much you need to explain, and how much, how, how you explain it. So, yeah. so um, you know, if I'm giving a talk about the universe or something, um, I'm not necessarily, my goal is not necessarily to inject all of the knowledge into the audience, right? Um, my goal may be to spark curiosity, or my goal may be to help people have a feeling that they can explore this stuff on their own, or give people an aha moment, or somehow change the perspective uh, through which people see the universe, and so I, it's not to me. It's not that important to um, you know to be a dictionary of facts uh, for people because that's not how people understand things. It's not how people learn things. So so when I talk about uh, science communication uh, to people in my field, I, I I say you know what what people the way people learn and understand things is through um, stories and emotion and people. And so you have to work that stuff into whatever you're explaining if you want the audience to absorb anything. Um, and sometimes what you want the audience to absorb is the idea that there's cool stuff out there, now you've learned a thing, here are other things you can, tr you can go and learn if you're so inclined. Um, but I, I'm not, I can't like, um, you know, be a textbook implanted into other people's brains and, I'm, and that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's it, 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 using the science in as it's needed in the story in a way that fits in the story and drives the plot, I think, is, is exactly the right approach because then, like, there's context to it, there's a story to it, and, and people do gain some understanding um, in a way that's interesting and useful and, and helps pull the story along. Yeah. I think for me, um, when I'm doing science journalism, uh, there's two things that are really difficult. Uh, maybe it's that 20%, or maybe it's just um, kind of the difficulty of talking about science. Um, and one of them is, uh, you know, certainly the obvious thing, which is taking a very complicated concept and explaining it in a way that's interesting to read. 
Um, but I think that even more than that, uh, the tough part is explaining the fact that science isn't, there's no answer. Um, and I think readers, especially when they're reading the newspaper, and I write a lot for newspapers, or if they're reading, you know, maybe they're reading a longer magazine article, but still, when you read about science, and I do this too, I'm like, give me the fucking answer, okay? I want to know, like, you know, how is the universe going to end, Katie? Like, I, you know, it's like, I, you know, we were at Katie's talk last night, like, it was frustrating, because she's like, well, there's five ways, and they could happen anytime or never. Um, and that's, that's the thing about science that is glorious, because science is one of those belief systems and methods which does not claim absolute truth, unlike other ideologies or dogmas we could name, which we won't. Um, it just claims, hey, we have a lot of evidence uh, for a couple of different things. And there's almost always a debate, not not always, but a lot of the, the stuff that I write about now, because I write a lot about archaeology, um, and archaeology is one of those things where like, yeah, we just don't know unless we invent a time machine, um, which I guess we could if we had tachyons, perhaps. Yeah, um, that would be awesome. Yeah, and I, I, don't, every, I just wrote a novel about time travel, and every physicist I talked to said, ha. No. Um, so we're not going to get to do that. And so when I write about, for example, a 9,000-year-old city that was abandoned and is now, we don't know why it was abandoned, um, you know, there's different hypotheses about it, and there's evidence, and people are interpreting it, and there's debate. And it's very, very hard to capture that um, without either reducing it to, like, two people are fighting over something, which is a very, which isn't really what's going on, um, or without just leaving the reader feeling like, so we just don't. No. Um, and like I said, that's the beauty of science. It's always an invitation to learn more, to find out more, to admit that you don't know, um, and have that kind of open space of, of not knowing. But there is, I mean, it's unsatisfying. And, and so that's, I think, the tough part, is always leaving the reader feeling like, well, there is some satisfaction, there is a conclusion, um, but also, we don't know. That, that's one of the things I find hardest about uh, talking about physics in particular is, um, properly portraying our uncertainty um, because yeah. you know like there are things that we're we're really pretty clueless about um, and then there are things that we we know exactly how it works um, except maybe at the edges uh, where where there's a little bit of uncertainty so for, so for example I mean a lot of people think of scientific uh, progress as you have a, an old theory and then something happens, someone comes up with a new theory and you throw out the old theory. And that's, that's not how it works at all. What, what generally happens is you have, you have a theory like, for example, Newtonian mechanics um, that works perfectly well in every situation you're going to encounter in your daily life. And then, you know, you, come, you, show, you end up with uh, Einstein's relativity. Um, which extends it to situations you're not going to encounter, like a rocket going at half the speed of light, or you know, hanging out near a black hole, or something like that. Um, so the the relativity one is more correct in the sense that it covers more situations, but Newtonian mechanics is still correct um, in the sense that every possible situation in which you're likely to encounter motion and gravity, um, you're going to get exactly the right answer um, or exact enough. For you to measure, and so the idea that like there are things we don't understand, like we don't understand how gravity and quantum mechanics work together, um, you know, the theory of, of things that have mass and the theory of, of tiny particles, we don't understand that connection. But that doesn't mean that you know telekinesis is possible, you know, like so. There's there are what? things that, <laughs> right. but, but I mean, this is the thing when you say like oh there are things we don't understand, people are like oh well I can I can do this then. It's like no actually, you know. Yeah. Um, there's the there's the bounds of what we don't yeah, understand, yeah. and that's what you kind of have to get at I think yeah. in, in science writing, and I think that's what all of us try to do is capture. I mean, oftentimes science fiction writers will talk about a sense of wonder, mm -hmm. and I think in a way that sense of wonder is that moment of saying oh. There's all these possibilities, but those possibilities rest on top of certainties that we have and that we've learned through gathering evidence. And so there's that moment of like, oh, well, we can't have telekinesis, but yeah, maybe we could have interstellar travel, you know? So yeah. I think that's, um, that's, I don't know, that's why science is so fucking rad. Yeah, one of the things, as, as you all are talking, one of the things that I, I'm thinking about is that part of the challenge is that that audiences tend to have a fairly narrow idea of what science is, but we're actually interacting with science like all the time. I mean, this this microphone is science. This is practical science happening right now. Um, and 
and this is part of why, I, when I'm working with uh, trying to put science in books, I treat it like a magic system because there's so much science that we interact with on a daily basis. We don't. Know. I mean, like the average person has no actual idea how it works. Like, you know, I mean, I have this magic rock in my in my pocket. And because of reasons, it doesn't work right now the way it normally works. <laughs> and then, and then when I go to the bathroom, there's this there's this faucet thing coming out of the wall. And if I wave my hand in exactly the right pass, water will come out of the wall. But sometimes the pass doesn't work, and the water doesn't come out of the wall. And I have to do different things, and then it doesn't work at all. And I step away, and then it totally works just fine for someone else. <laughs> That's science. <laughs> and I'm sure that there are reasons that all of that happens that are science reasons, but it's also magic. <laughs> you actually bring up a very good point, which I want to address. When you were saying that when you were talking to audiences, and the audiences sometimes seem to have a very narrow view of what science is, it brings up the question of when one is talking about science or trying to explain science, um, what sort of competency, knowledge, or understanding generally, I mean, I understand specific audiences will have specific levels, but generally, what can one assume that uh, an outside audience will bring to it? And as a, as a corollary to this, does this ebb and flow? Like, for example, just, you know, sometimes it feels like we are in a low science acceptance era. Uh, and uh, having come from one that previously, before science was much more kind of, people were much more excited about it. So what can you expect, uh, or should you expect, uh, in terms of level of understanding of science, and then uh, how do you work with that uh, in, your, in, your, in your writing and presentations? So it, it does ebb and flow a lot. Let me, let me actually give an example of the ebbing and flowing of, of uh, knowledge, not from hard science, but uh, political science, which is my brother is a, a history teacher, and he said that on the, uh, I think it's the CSA, no, the, the AP exams, um, a couple of years ago, they had to pull all of the questions about Alexander Hamilton off, <laughs> because suddenly there was this huge bump and spike of knowledge. And it was totally breaking the test. <laughs> so it's like, they're like, well, I guess we can't ask questions about banking in the early part of the... So, <laughs> so, so this, this does go back and forth. Um, and, and it is one of the challenges when you're, when you're writing uh, something that's science fiction. Also, there are things that you that I will write that are science, there's a, a couple of stories that I wrote that were science fiction when I wrote them that are no longer science fiction. Um, so for me, what I'm, when I'm sitting down to write something, I kind of take a look at what the zeitgeist is at the moment, like with, uh, with the Lady Astronaut stuff, because I happen to be working on them during the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions, people's awareness is higher and there are fewer things that I have to explain than I did before. Um, like I, I used to have to work really, really hard to um, explain that there were women who did math and they were called computers and then hidden figures came out and that's no longer something that I have to explain. Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting because uh, now that I divide my time between writing about science in a nonfiction mode and in science fiction, um, I think science fiction audiences, um, perhaps not surprisingly, are much more interested in science and open to science than your average reader of a newspaper or a magazine. Um, and so I often, one of the joys of writing science fiction is I feel like I don't need to do a lot of explaining. Um, and in my novel Autonomous, there's robot characters. It's in the future, so they're, you know, they have human equivalent intelligence, and they're exchanging data, and when they talk to each other wirelessly, they say, hello, my name is Paladin. Let's use this protocol, the security protocol. Here comes my data. Um, and, you know, people will get that joke, or they won't get that joke. Um, and it doesn't matter because if they're, you know, if they're immersed in the world of like data packets or if they're working with network computers, they get it. And if they don't, it's still just part of the story and they're open to it. And they, they just are like, okay, that's how computers talk in the future. That's how robots talk. Um, but when you're writing <clears throat> science journalism, 
um, you, you can't really assume uh, very much, and also you have to assume a level of hostility. Mm -hmm. um, and with my work that I've been doing on ancient abandoned cities, um, one of the things that comes up again and again is that people abandon cities because the environment changes, because there's climate change. And, um, <clears throat> and this is something that has been demonstrated by huge amounts of data. Um, and, and it's something that we're experiencing now. Cities are going to be slowly abandoned, uh, especially at the coasts, because of climate change. And people don't want to hear it. It's very hard. And I've had to come up with all kinds of creative ways to talk about climate change to be like, to, so that people won't just immediately like have their eyes roll up in their head and start like twitching and like throw the paper away. Um, so we talk about things like extreme weather instead of talk, instead of using the words climate change because it's such a trigger phrase for people. Um, and so you kind of have to weirdly, <clears throat> you know, you're almost sort of sneaking around and kind of making uh, fictionalizing what you're saying in the nonfiction more than in the fiction. Um, and, and it is honestly one of the reasons I started writing fiction was because I got so frustrated with people um, <laughs> responding in a hostile way to, to factual science, um, both about climate change and also about evolution, because uh, there's just it's just so toxic uh, to talk about right now, especially on the internet. So <laughs> I I feel like I I don't know that I have a sort of baseline assumption about uh, understanding. Um, for, for audiences in general. I, I really try hard to tailor my message to an audience. So, and sometimes that's hard because sometimes you have a really broad audience and then you have to um, you have to tailor how you talk about things to an audience that's a mix of people who understand, who, who have very little background knowledge and people who have a lot of background knowledge. Um, the, the one thing I do try to, is, I, I do assume generally is that people are interested um, because I, so I, I don't do um, I don't do uh, the kind of general science journalism where my audience is likely to be hostile. Um, so I, I generally write for like sciencey magazines or um, for my Twitter followers or something where I, I can be reasonably sure that that they're at least slightly on board with the whole science thing. Um, but but it is really important to change how I talk about things um, so as not to alienate people on either side of the knowledge spectrum. Um, and so the, the sort of general assumption I make is that people are interested and willing to think and reasonably intelligent, um, but they just might not have had a lesson on you know um, electron orbitals or something like that. And so I, I have to kind of build that in in a way that is not going to offend the sensibilities of a person who you know does uh, spectroscopy for a living, but also is going to be, um, you know, interesting and and accessible to somebody who has, has a vague understanding that electrons are a thing, but not, uh, but doesn't have um, that that background. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, that's, and that's a matter of, like, using metaphors and being clear when it's a metaphor and it's not exactly the whole thing, because sometimes people get real confused when when scientists use metaphors and don't explain that it is a metaphor, and I know that because I get letters from people saying, you know, what if this thing is real and it's because they heard a metaphor and they think it's the real thing and then it, they just uh -huh. build on that and it gets really complicated. Um, so I try, and, I try and use metaphors, I try and use, um, you know, uh, connections to things people already know about or already excited about. Um, and I try to use language that, that, uh, that people will understand, and that's, uh, and that's that's not you know you don't have to entirely avoid jargon like there's this there's this idea that jargon is awful in science communication you should never use complicated words and I don't think that's true I think people sometimes enjoy learning new words and new concepts um, and uh, and then can can run with that but you, you do have to put them in context and you do have to sort of explain what they are so. You know, uh, like last night I was talking about tachyons, and so now you know a larger number of people can hear the word tachyon and know that that is a, a sort of theoretical particle that would travel faster than light and might go backward in time. And so that's you know that's kind of a cool thing. Now you, you know there's this word that we've all heard in Star Trek, but um, it actually does correspond to a, a real thing in theoretical <laughs> physics. Um, and so that you know that can be fun. I think people enjoy learning new words and people enjoy learning new concepts. Um, but people don't enjoy being talked down to in a way that's condescending, and people don't enjoy um, having being, you know, 
when you talk over their heads and, and, and make them feel like they're they're just like totally out to see on, on the stuff. So so it, it really is, you do have to kind of find a balance. And most people, you know, most of the time if somebody is an expert in something and you kind of explain from the ground up, um, they're just they're just gonna feel really happy that they already knew that. Um, so it, you don't you don't really go wrong um, by by putting things in simpler terms or more accessible terms, I should say. Um, even if it's even if you do have people in the audience who are already expert. So one of the things that I, as you were talking, I was like, you know, it's not the problem that I run into is not actually conveying information to the audience or, or uh, you know, wondering what their baseline is in of understanding. It's wondering what their baseline of misunderstanding is, like the things that they're wrong about that they think that they know. Those are the things that I like. Getting people to unlearn stuff is so much harder. In the uh, in the Lady Astronaut book, I slam a meteor or I slam an asteroid into uh, the Chesapeake Bay, and a water strike. It turns out is way way worse for the planet than a land strike um, because it punches a hole in the atmosphere. I mean, it punches a hole in the atmosphere regardless, but. Uh, with the ejecta for a land strike, you get you get dust up into the upper atmosphere, and that settles out. But you get water vapor up there, and it doesn't settle out. And then you can get a runaway greenhouse effect. So everyone knows that when a meteor, excuse me, a meteorite hits the Earth, that the planet gets colder. With a water strike, the planet actually heats up. You get colder a little bit, and then it heats up, and you can get a runaway greenhouse effect. And there's a chance that that's what happened to Venus. Um, that, that Venus may have been like Earth, and then something big hit it, and it turned into Venus. Um, but the number of letters that I have received, excuse me, from guys, <laughs> that preface it with, I'm not a scientist, but... <laughs> no. <laughs> this doesn't make sense to me because Everyone knows that when a rock hits the earth, it gets colder, and there's water in the atmosphere already, it rains. Seriously, someone has said this to me. More than one someone. So, how do you, do you, do you have to deal with this when you're writing with people who are like, but excuse me, tachyons are the, a thing that they use on Star Trek. And, like, do you, how much unlearning do you have to deal with? Yeah, there's there's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, uh, yeah. I mean, one of the things that happens is people love learning about space and the universe, and so people watch uh, TV shows about it. They read books about it. They read articles, and sometimes, um, and sometimes something goes wrong in that process where, um, you know, uh, so like I said, one one problem would be. A metaphor um, that is taken too far, um, or uh, you know, or something where things are stretched a little bit to make it sound more exciting. And then, if that's the only thing, if that's the only way you've encountered these ideas, then sometimes people are, you know, people are naturally curious and creative. And so, a lot of times, uh, I'll get the situation where um, either either somebody just has a totally wrong notion about something. Or somebody starts from a wrong notion and then, then you know, realizes that from that starting point you can make a logical flow to something really cool, and so then they think that they've solved physics, um, and they're writing emails about this. Um, oh, and, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and they want and, and you know and they want my uh, my feedback about um, you know oh I think I've, I've solved this thing or I've just I've had this amazing insight. And usually it flows from, from a, a, a who is communicating the thing, doesn't properly communicate that, you know, this is a simplified idea. Actually, you have to do many years of graduate study to, um, to get a true understanding of this. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of math that I'm sort of sweeping under the rug in order to portray this kind of cool idea. Um, if that stuff isn't properly, um, you know, put out there, then People just get the idea that it's a whole lot simpler and easier than it is. I mean, the the example that I always use is that sometimes when when talking about cosmology, um, scientists or science communicators will will focus on the ooh ah aspect, you know, the sort of like oh amazing, you know, dead space time and, and time travel and curved space and you know all this sort of thing. 
Um, and then uh, and then there will be an article about like some new idea that somebody had for which there's a massive amount of you know mathematical back end and years and years of, of model development, but but it comes out with like a, a neat illustration, and um, and then people get the impression that cosmologists are just kind of sitting in a room, you know, um, smoking something and being like, what if the universe is shaped like a football, you know, and then that's the big that's the big aha, you know, eureka moment, and and that's not how it works at all, and so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's a hard thing to portray because you want to keep the sense of wonder and the sense of discovery and the you know the possibility of these big insights and eureka moments. But you also want to to say you know but but this this is a technical field and and there are all these steps that you have to take and and we you know I can help you to understand a piece of this and you know and that might be you know that might be a really cool thing for both of us. But if you want to. Um, really run with it, there's, there's just a ton of work um, that has to be done in the background. Yeah, it's hard to get people to unlearn stuff that they learned like in high school and college. Um, even though as we've been talking about up here a lot, like of course um, hypotheses are often changing. Um, and the one that I get the most angry email about uh, is the, the new hypothesis about how um, humans arrived in the Americas which a lot of people learned in school uh, was that um, humans came from uh, you know, the sort of Siberia region over the Bering Land Bridge and then just kind of walked just real easily uh, through a bunch of glaciers um, into North America. Um, and that that probably happened about 12,000 years ago. Um, and in the last 20 years, um, there have been discovery after discovery after discovery of um, sites that are much older than 12,000 years um, in uh, the Americas, uh, all the way down to the tip of um, South America, uh, where we see sites that are you know, 17,000 years old, um, and they're all along the coast. Hmm, what could that mean? Wow. Um, and so what we find is that um, you know, as, as more excavations are taking place along the coast, and a lot of these are, are underwater excavations, um, that people probably left uh, from that same sort of uh, Siberian region, some, some group that had been living in uh, you know, East Asia and kind of north, um, took reed boats and, and sort of floated all along, you know, not in one trip, uh, but that, that they that they took that they had the technology to uh, boat all the way basically down to Chile, uh, you know, just going along the coast, um, and that this would have taken place, you know, over thousands of years, and it would have been people kind of going a short way and settling, and then a new group kind of settling, um, and we even see uh, evidence, for example, in Oregon, uh, there's like a 14,000 year old site which uh, is along a, um, an ancient riverway, so we know that they would kind of go in, like they'd be like, hey, we got to Oregon, it's great here, let's take a little trip down this river and then settle uh, somewhere. Um, and people are just freaked out by that idea, because what it means is that a whole bunch of different groups settled the Americas over time, because there was a group that came over the land bridge too, later, after the glaciers melted enough that they could do that, um, at, these are the Beringians, um, which you may have read about uh, if you're interested in this. Um, but so it complicates not just what we learned, but it also complicates our understanding of how populations work. Because I think, uh, again, many people were raised with this idea of out of Africa, where there's just like one group of people came from one place and spread throughout the world. And it's like, that's not how it works. There were a ton of different groups. They were all having sex and having babies. Um, and you know, we're a big mixed bag of humans. And, and so if, if people get, not only do they get upset that, you know, how could these ancient people have had boats? You know, they couldn't have done that. Um, so there's that kind of thing of like, how could they even have had the boats? <laughs> Right, exactly, and these are people who kind of come before uh, the genetic ancestors of, uh, of indigenous people in, in the United States, in sort of North and South America. So this is a previous group um, who, of course, was you know hanging out also with the later group that came in. So, but that's what's complicated, right? It's like it's not just like one group said like, "Hey, you guys, let's take the land bridge." <laughs> we like rode on mammoths across the land bridge. Um, it took like a week. You know, and then we like settled in Wyoming or something like that, right? So um, it's it's upsetting because it's such a messy story. It's like okay, a whole bunch of different groups came at different times. They were kind of different um, populations, 
Um, and it's and again, it's that it's that complexity. You know, it's yeah. it's like what we want there to be a simple story, and it's just it's just as messy as immigrations and migrations today. Um, humans have been migrating forever, um, for as long as we've been human. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's like you kind of have. It, it almost makes you want to write fiction because people's minds are more open when they're reading okay. fiction, and they don't feel as troubled by that because it's not their own history. Um, so yeah, it's it's, uh, it's always you always have to figure out a new way to tell that story. Okay, so we are at about the 14 minute and 28 second mark, which means I'm going to ask one more question up here, and then we are going to open up uh, to questions. What do we remember about questions? Questions should be in the form of a question. How many parts should each question have? One. How long should the question be? Twitter length. You are amazing people, and each of you are quality. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the last question I want to ask before we open up to uh, questions to the audience is, we were talking uh, we talked a little bit about, and by the way, such a fantastic panel because here are all the questions that I had here. You just answered them while you were talking, so I did <laughs> almost nothing, which is the best way to moderate. Um, but we were talking about, you know, the, uh, the question of, we started with, you know, what sort of, uh, what do we do when we reach the, or to figure out the limits of the knowledge and understanding of the folks who we're talking to? Let me ask you, and you touched on it very briefly, Mary, but I want uh, all of you to expand on it in about three and a half minutes. What do you do when you reach the limits of your own knowledge and understanding, and but you still have presentations to make, deadlines to hit, books to write? How do you solve that problem? Uh, to present credible uh, science presentation. I get someone who's smarter than me to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's, I, I, and you do that all the time. Like every, anytime you go and you read a textbook, you're getting someone who's smarter than you to fill in the gaps in your knowledge. It's just when I am on a deadline, um, the, the second lady astronaut book in particular, I had to write really, really fast for reasons. And it, is a giant thing of Mad Libs. They're part of that book that are technically written by astronauts. <laughs> um, there are parts of that book that are written by rocket scientists and astronomers. Um, so I don't, what I try to do is I try to provide a framework to, uh, for the audience to latch hold of, and then I use the experts to, to give me the, uh, the, the details and, and to tell me to spot places that I'm um, that I'm wrong or or opportunities that I'm missing. Um, well, I get uh, sent a lot of um, press releases from you know universities and scientific journals saying like, hey, cover our thing, um, and um, which is delightful. They're always um, really interesting. But I think for me, uh, I always approach any story with ex not extreme skepticism, but I always want to have some skepticism about whatever scientific paper I'm being presented with. And by that I mean I want to always talk to outside sources, like people who haven't worked on the paper, uh, or people who haven't even necessarily worked on that particular narrow field. Um, so say, for example, I'm writing about um, the population of the Americas, like I was just talking about. Um, I would always want to talk to someone who had worked on, say, a different excavation somewhere. So if it's like uh, a particular site in Texas, um, it would be great to talk to somebody who was at a different site in Texas, um, and where did, how did their findings fit in with the findings at this other site? Um, and if their findings are wildly off, um, that's something, that's a red flag to me, and then I would want to talk to another person. So I think it's always, um, and, and this is good, just like a quick scientific, um, if you're a science, if you love reading science journalism, um, what you should always look for to be um, sure that what you're reading is actually um, dealing with the material in a um, comprehensive way is, are they actually talking to people that didn't work on the exact thing they're writing about? So if there's a new discovery, um, have they talked to someone at a different university or who is in uh, a completely, who, who hasn't contributed to that? Um, do they actually talk to someone who disagrees and present their point of view? Um, and when I say disagrees, I don't mean like if they're talking about climate change, did they get a climate denier to say like, it's all wrong. Um, I need someone who says like, well, here's another hypothesis for why this is happening. Um, so I think that's to me the most important thing is to always be, even when I'm talking to a scientist, 
to not assume that just because they're a scientist, they know all the answers or that they've reached the correct answer, that there's always a context where they're doing their work and there's always another possibility. Yeah. Uh, briefly, uh, yes. Katie, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, 100% um, agree with that. It, like, when you read a story about, about science, if it's only the person who wrote the paper who is quoted in the in the article, it is a bad article. Um, I mean, I mean, like it's it's you know, you because I, I see these all the time, and and then people write to me and they're like, oh, I heard that you know that they, they discovered there's no dark matter. It's like no, it's because you read an article that was only quoting the one person who doesn't think dark matter is real. Don't you know you have to? There's it's a bigger story. Um, but but to speak to the, the question when when I don't. When I reach the limits of my knowledge, I just I say I don't know the thing, or um, or I, I you know I, I I try and find out obviously. But if I'm like giving a presentation and somebody asks a question and I don't know the answer, I will say I don't know the answer and I'll have to think about it or I'll have to look it up or whatever. I'll move. <laughs> that's like, I want to say like that's how you know someone is a good scientist is when they will say I don't know. Yeah, that is always the sign of. I mean, sometimes I'll say I think, you know, or maybe, or I guess, but I won't. I won't say this is a fact uh, without knowing that it's a fact. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. No, I, I was just that brief story that illustrates this. My mom has Parkinson's. This is fine, and she's had it for years. Um, she's had it for 15 years, in fact. So she was in the hospital, and this hospitalist said, for for something else, and the, this hospitalist said to us. Well, what you have to understand is that Parkinson's is a movement disorder. And I'm like, no. <laughs> really? Now, for a neurologist, on the other hand, was like, whoa, that's weird. I don't know why that's happening. So much more confidence in the neurologist mm -hmm. and her lack of, of answer than in the hospitalist. And his comp he had an answer, which was bullshit. <laughs> But yeah, so I'm like, yes, if someone tells me I don't know, and they're telling it from a, a place of knowledge, I'm like, oh, this is cool stuff. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna get to questions. Raise your hand, and then uh, Sarah will come over and uh, talk to you about it. And uh, remember, please keep it as brief as possible, so we can get to as many as possible in seven minutes, 33 seconds, go. Quick question for Katie. Uh, do you have any YouTube channels, blogs, or other sources of articles that you would recommend for me to share with my friends on social media to engage conversations about science? Oh gosh, uh, way too many uh, good ones out there to, to possibly uh, cite some. Uh, I, I don't know, um, uh, Minute Physics is really good um, uh, for, for physics, um, and uh, 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 I don't know. Uh, there's, there's so many. Um, that's the one that comes to mind because I, I just did a collaboration with them and, and it's really cool. Um, but uh, there's tons of them. There's, there's a really cool, extremely um, in-depth, geeky podcast called um, The Titanium Physicists um, that I've been on a couple of times. And they go real deep dive into physics questions, but in an accessible way. And that's a lot of fun, too. So if you're into physics, uh, check that out. Okay. Next question. Okay, so uh, you've talked about science facts, communicating science facts. How important do you think it is to communicate how scientists socially, amongst themselves, develop the facts? Very important. Extremely important. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. I think, and that's. <clears throat> I think the important part about that is that it shows people how the scientific process works, and that it's sometimes a series of mistakes, or like you kind of don't kind of back into something and um, you know it shows the human side and, and I think that's great. I think it's generally more important than just getting the facts across is is explaining how how we get to those ideas um, because the because people not understanding that is worse for you know science and society than people not knowing a fact that they can look up in a, in a you know in Wikipedia or something. Okay next question. Uh, can you cite an example of an ancient city that was abandoned due to climate change that we might be aware of? Um, have you heard of the great city of Angkor, uh, which is where the temple Angkor Wat is located? It's in Cambodia today, but about a thousand years ago it was the center of the Khmer Empire, which encompassed like Thailand and Vietnam and Laos um, and Cambodia. 
Um, it was the largest city in the world at that time, but a million people lived there, and they had a big water problem uh, because of changing weather, but also because of the general, they have a really weird monsoon type season. They have kind of a double monsoon. Um, they had amazing water technology, but due to uh, religious <laughs> problems and political mismanagement, their water management system started to fail, and so it was a combination of political and climate failure, which probably sounds totally unfamiliar to us today. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's, it is widely attested in the literature that, um, that Angkor was abandoned due to climate issues. Also, many of the, uh, the Mayan civilization cities had a similar kind of problem. Okay, next question. And then we'll do one more question after that. Is it at all viable to put things like citations or where, ways to find more information on a topic in like the back of fiction novels? Oh, I, I do. My, my books actually have bibliographies at the back of them. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I do a, an about the history and the author notes. Um, lots of people will just put stuff at the back. I've seen people do footnotes. Um, I am less of a fan of footnotes. Um, if you would like to read an example of where this goes terribly, terribly wrong, um, <laughs> Werner von Braun, uh, who uh, is widely regarded as the father of, of American rocketry or of modern rocketry, um, in the nineteen in nineteen forty seven wrote a book called Mars: A Technical Tale, where he attempted to harness the power of fiction to get people excited about going into space. Technically, it's a novel. <laughs> it was very useful to me when I was writing my novel because it is filled with tables <laughs> and charts and footnotes and an appendix and I think the appendices may have more word count than the novel itself <laughs> so you can but it kind of slows the action down my favorite footnotes in a novel are in um, Jonathan Strange and yes. Marvel, which is like they're basically just a joke, like, yeah. and they're huge, and they'll be like, oh, and here's like a seven-page footnote. Um, it's completely delightful. A great novel, by the way. You should definitely read it. Um, and there's a great BBC miniseries. Um, I also, I have a novel coming out um, in September, which is a um, time travel novel that has a giant, uh, are you? I'm waiting for you to finish so I can get that last question. Okay, okay. sorry. Um, it has a giant thing at the end. You can hear me read from it in like an hour. Right here. Yeah. We're going to have uh, one more question, and then, then the panelists are going to tell you what they're going to be doing for the rest of the day. So, uh, very quick question and very quick answer, hopefully. What uh, science or technology that this already very sophisticated audience is probably not aware of would you love to see fictionalized in the next couple of years? Uh, somebody asked me something very similar uh, last night, and I couldn't, couldn't think of anything. Um, I don't know, uh, gravitational waves are awesome, and it would be cool to see more about gravitational waves in fiction, because they're neat. I've only read one story that had anything to do with gravitational waves, and it was very cool. I, basically, anything that she's talking about, I want to see. <laughs> I would take, I've been literally taking notes every time she talks. <laughs> I want to see more geoscience, uh, more plate tectonics. Yeah. All right, very quickly, uh, going down from Mary, moving this way, tell us what you're doing uh, presentation-wise today. The very next thing is I'm going to be at BB King's doing Ask a Puppet with, Woo! shockingly, a puppet. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can ask the puppet questions about anything, and also there's a chance for you to play with uh, some puppetry and do some video stuff. Uh, I'm going to be reading at 2.30 here on the main stage, which I think is right after Ed right. Lee reads. And then at 10 o'clock tonight, I will be part of the Disney sing-along. Yeah! Uh, and I'll be doing Poor Unfortunate Souls for those of you yes. who are any yes. Sean and McGuire fans out here. Yeah! yeah. All right, I'm going to be doing Poor Unfortunate Souls. Yes! Yes! Okay. I'm just chilling out for the rest of the day. Okay, Anna Lee? Um, I'm going to be doing a reading here at 12.30 today uh, with the inimitable Charlie Jane Anders. Um, and then I'm having office hours at the Lido Bar from 2 to 3. <laughs> so come buy me a drink because I'll be done for the day at that point. Or I'll buy you a drink, whatever. And I have a reading at 1.30, so it goes, Annalie, Charlie Jane, meet 
Mary Robinette Cole, you don't have to leave the room. Except to come see me do puppets. Except stuff. to see that's you go right. do puppets, but that's going to be, so puppets, and Ali, me, Mary, Mary Robinette, and then, <laughs> and I'm also at 10 o'clock in, uh, for the sing-along, I will be doing um, Cruella de Vil. Uh, Thank yeah. you everybody for coming.